For, for me, they normally happen, these, uh, the, these career crises. Often, actually, on a Sunday evening, just as the sun is starting to set and the gap between my hopes for myself and the reality of my life start to diverge so painfully that I normally end up weeping into a pillow. Have you ever weeped into your pillow because of your job? Well, I certainly have not, because I don't have a job. But uh, I have been made fun of for playing golf numerous times. So I, I guess that counts. According to philosopher Elinda Botton, these feelings of inadequacy are attributed to the rise of envy and job snobbery in the 21st century, all due to the many pitfalls of equality and meritocracy, as explained by his 2009 TED Talk, A Kinder, Gentler Philosophy of Success. Now, I'm mentioning all this because I think this is not merely a personal issue. I think we live in an age when our lives are regularly punctuated by career crises, by moments when what we thought we knew about our lives, about our careers, comes into contact with a, a threatening reality. It's perhaps easier now than ever before to make a good living, but it's perhaps harder now than ever before to be free of career anxiety. So I want to look now at some of the reasons why we might be feeling more anxious about our careers today, why we might be victims of these career crises as we're weeping softly into our pillows. One of the reasons why we might be suffering is that we are surrounded by snobs. <laughs> now, now what, what is a snob? Well, a snob is anybody who takes a small part of you and uses that to come to a complete vision of who you are. That is snobbery. The dominant kind of snobbery that exists nowadays is job snobbery. You encounter within minutes at a party when you get asked that famous, iconic question of the 21st century. So, uh, what do you do? According to how you answer that question, people are either incredibly delighted to see you, or they look at their watch and start to make their excuses. Now, the opposite of a snob is your mother. Well, not necessarily your mother, or indeed mine, but as, as it were, the ideal mother, someone who doesn't care about your achievements. Unfortunately, most people are not our mothers. Most people make a strict correlation between how much time, if you like, love, they're willing to accord us. That will be strictly defined by our position in the social hierarchy. Now, there are other reasons why we might be feeling more anxious about our status in the world today. Uh, one of these, it, it's paradoxical because it's linked to something that's rather nice, is the hope we all have for our careers. See, never before have expectations been so high about what human beings can achieve with their lifespan. We're told from many sources that anyone can achieve anything. We, we've done away with the caste system. We are now in a system where anyone can rise to any position they please. And it's a beautiful idea. Along with that is the spirit of equality. We're all basically equal. There's one really big problem with this, and that problem is envy. See, if there's one dominant emotion in modern society, that is envy, and it's linked to the spirit of equality. Let me explain. See, I think it would be very unusual for anyone here to be envious of the Queen of England, even though she's much richer than any of you are, and she's got a very large house. The reason we don't envy her is because she's too weird. I mean, she speaks in a funny way. She comes from an odd place. So we can't relate to her. And when you can't relate to someone, you don't envy them. But the closer two people are in age and background, in the process of identification, the more there's a danger of envy. Which is incidentally why none of you should ever go to a school reunion, because there's no stronger reference point than people one was at school with. You see, you see, the problem of modern society is that it turns the whole world into a school. Everybody's wearing jeans, everybody's the same, yet they're not. So there's a spirit of equality combined with a deep inequality, which can make for a very stressful situation. You know, it's probably as unlikely that you would nowadays become as rich and famous as Bill Gates as it was unlikely in the 17th century that you would accede to the ranks of the French aristocracy. But, but the point is, it, it doesn't feel that way. 
it's made to feel, but magazines and other media outlets, that if you got energy, if you brought ideas about technology, uh, a garage, you too could start a major thing. You see, there's a real correlation between a society that tells people they can do anything and the existence of low self-esteem. So that's another way in which something quite positive can have a nasty kickback. Now there is another reason why we might be feeling more anxious about our careers today. And it's again linked to something nice. And that nice thing is meritocracy. Now, you see, everyone agrees that meritocracy is a great thing and we should all be trying to make our societies really, really meritocratic. Uh, well, first, what is a meritocratic society? Well, a meritocratic society is one in which if you got talent and energy and skill, you will get to the top. Nothing should hold you back. And it's a beautiful idea. But the problem is, if you really believe in a society where those who merit to get to the top, get to the top, then you also, by implication in a far nastier way, believe in a society where those who merit to get to the bottom, get to the bottom and stay there. In other words, your position in life comes not to seem accidental, but merited and deserved, which can make failure seem much more crushing. You know, in the Middle Ages in England, when you met a very poor person, that person would be described as an unfortunate, literally someone who was not blessed by fortune. Nowadays, if you meet someone at the bottom of society, they may unkindly be described as a loser. There's a real difference between an unfortunate and a loser. And that shows 400 years of evolution in our society and our belief and who is responsible for our lives. It's no, it's no longer the gods, it's us. We're in the driving seat. See, that, that's exhilarating if you're doing well, and very crushing if you're not. It leads, in the worst cases, in the analysis of sociologists like Emil Durkheim, it leads to increased rates of suicide. There, there are more suicides in developed individualistic countries than any other part of the world. And some of the reason for that is that people take what happens to them extremely personally. They own their success, but they also own their failure. Now, I'm drawn to a lovely quote by St. Augustine in the City of God, where he says, it's a sin to judge any man by his post. In modern English, that would mean it's a sin to come to any view of who you should talk to depending on their business card. It's not the post that should count. So, in other words, hold your horses when you come to judge people. You don't necessarily know what someone's true value is. That is an unknown part of them, and we should not behave as though it is known. Now see, what I think I've been talking about really is success and failure. And one of the interesting things about success is that we think we know what it means. See, if I told you there's someone behind the screen who's very successful, certain ideas would immediately come to mind. You think that person made a lot of money, achieved renown in some field. But the thing about a successful life is that a lot of the time, our perceptions of what it would mean to live successfully are not our own. They're sucked in from other people. So what I want to argue for is not that we should give up on our ideas of success, but we should make sure that they are our own. We should focus on our ideas, and make sure that we own them, that we are truly the authors of our own ambitions. Because it's bad enough not getting what you want, but it's even worse to have an idea of what it is you want and find out at the end of the journey that it isn't, in fact, what you wanted all along. So uh, I'm going to end it there. But what, what I really want to stress is, by all means, success, yes. But let's accept the strangeness of some of our ideas. Let's probe away at our notions of success. Let's make sure that our ideas of success are truly our own. Thank you very much.